of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, God's grace, mercy, and peace are with all of you. Amen. God's word for our devotion tonight from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 to 9. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who believe in him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So far the words of our text. The payment that God demanded for our sins was a perfect sacrifice. The sacrifice had to be perfect. That meant not one fault or imperfection at all. It meant it had to be 100% holy and pure. It had to be perfect. That's the only way that the sacrifice that would be made could be made for the sins of the whole world and instead of the one who died, it had to be perfect. So we might, have asked, we might ask ourselves, then what happened with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane that night shortly before he was betrayed? The author of this text, when he said he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and pleas to the one who could save him from death was referring to the prayer that Jesus offered in the Garden of Gethsemane shortly before he was betrayed and arrested. Perhaps you'll remember the account. After Jesus and the disciples had eaten the Passover meal, that is the disciples minus Judas, they took a walk out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus left eight of the disciples by themselves and took Peter, James, and John a bit further into the garden. Then he left Peter, James, and John by themselves and, and went himself a stone's throw beyond them and began praying to his heavenly Father. Of course, there's nothing wrong with him praying to his heavenly Father, but do you remember the content of that prayer? Father, if it's possible, take this cup away from me. Three times Jesus offered that prayer. We're told that he was greatly struggling. The thought of everything that was about to happen to him was taking its toll on him. And that toll could be displayed physically in his body. We're told that his sweat was like drops of blood. He was agonizing. So we might ask, was Jesus losing it? Was his perfection starting to crack? Was all of this finally too much for him? Causing him to feel overburdened and, and overwhelmed? Was he not willing to submit to what the Father asked? Was he, was he sinning here? By not being willing to submit what the Father had asked of him. I mean, you could read this prayer from the standpoint of a, a little child whose dad was asking him or her to do something that he or she didn't want to do. And so they were begging, Daddy, please don't, don't make me do this. I don't want to have to do that. Please don't make me do it. Well, we might be tempted to think this was the manner in which Jesus was offering this prayer because that's often how you and I react to suffering. We don't always face the suffering that God asks us to face perfectly. In fact, any time we have to face suffering that God allows into our life or to, 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 to go through something that we don't want to have to go through, this is our, our reaction. Unwilling to submit whatever God has asked us to face, we go before Him begging and pleading, God, no, don't make me do that. And when God's answer to that begging or pleading is still no, and we find ourselves in the midst of our challenge, that's when we're tempted to, to gripe and complain and, and grumble about how mean and cruel God is, that He would ask us to face this. Maybe it's so bad we even go on the offensive, accusing God of wrongdoing or not caring or being aloof and not even in recognizing the problems we have to face. Boy, how selfish we can be. 
when it comes to the sufferings and the challenges God asks us to face. Yet that was the very reason Jesus was in the garden that evening. He was going to go through some great suffering and troubles and difficulties, none of which he had caused for himself. But he was in that garden suffering tremendously as our substitute. He was suffering for the sins of the world, the sins that you and I commit. That In that garden that night, the time had come for the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And what a burden it was that the Father had laid on, his, on, on Jesus by placing the guilt of the world's sin on the shoulders of his Son. I mean, we know what it's like to have that burden of sin weighing on our shoulders. We know the burden just one sin can put on our shoulders. You know what it's like when you, you hurt someone you love by doing something selfish? You're embarrassed. You feel guilty. You're ashamed. You feel horrible. You can't even look them in the face as you look down to the ground, and it's hard to admit your wrongs and ask for forgiveness. And, and even when you have their forgiveness, the seeing them instantly has that guilt and shame come flooding back to you, sometimes even years later. And that's just for one sin. Here's our Savior driven into the dust by the sins of the whole world. The haunting voices of billions of consciences bearing down upon Him and probably above all the prospect of having to face the white hot anger of a holy God while hanging from that shameful cross. Boy, no wonder his human nature was revolting at what was to come. No wonder he felt the burden placed very heavy upon his shoulders. He was carrying the sins of the world. Yet this is our joy. Instead of rebelling against his Heavenly Father, he brought this burden before his Heavenly Father in prayer and asked for help. Yes, looking into the cup that Jesus was asked to drink, his human nature revolted, much like the way a young child might revolt when, when that parent takes that icky-tasting medicine and sticks it out in front of them. But instead of being like that child and pushing the spoon away with the hand and, and spilling the contents and making a mess and refusing to drink, Jesus didn't do that in reverent submission. He willingly went forward to be our substitute. He not only prayed perfectly, but he perfectly obeyed the will of the Father and carried on with the mission to rescue us from our sin. God heard his prayer. And though his answer was no, I won't take this cup from you, he sent the angels to strengthen Jesus so he could continue on that path to rescue humankind, specifically not you and me, from the sins that we have committed and give to us the victory. Jesus is our perfect high priest. He made the perfect sacrifice that God demanded for our sins. He not only prayed perfectly, he obeyed perfectly. And because of that, he is the source of salvation for all who believe in him. As we ponder that thought, may we go forward confidently and willingly in our life to face whatever it is God might ask us to face. We do well at those times when God asks us to face those sufferings, to to remember of God's love and care. He didn't abandon us in our deepest, darkest hour. And he rescued us from the greatest problem that confronts us. He won't leave us as we face that suffering. And he promises that he will one day remove us from this suffering to be with him eternally in heaven. To strengthen, to encourage, and to walk with us as we walk through this earth until we enjoy the eternal mansions of life that God has waiting for us in heaven. May we continue to find our comfort and joy as we rejoice that Jesus is our 
perfect high priest. 